and let's worship the Lord. Oh 
love and that ancient cross how precious is my Savior's blood the beauty of heaven wrapped in my shame the image of love upon death's frame If having my heart was worth the pain, what joy could you see beyond the grave? If love found my soul worth dying for, how wonderful, how glorious. Savior scars, victorious, my chains are gone, my death is paid, from death to life, and grace to grace. How great is the hope that lives in you The passion that tore through hell like a rose The promise that rolled back the bandit stone Jesus, and from death to life, I will sing your praise in the wonder of your grace. When I see that cross, I see freedom. When I see that grave, I see Jesus. And from death to life, I will sing your praise in the wonder of your grace. When I see that cross, I see freedom. When I see that grave, I'll see Jesus. And from death to life, I will sing your praise. In the wonder of your grace. When I see that cross, I see freedom. When I see that grave, I see Jesus. And from death to life, I will sing your praise. In the wonder of your grace. How my soul. Sing your praise in the wonder of your grace. How my soul will sing your praise. Sing it out. How wonderful, how glorious, my Savior skies, victorious, my chains are. Freedom. When I see that grave, I see Jesus. 
stood tall and I have crumbled in the same breath. I have wrestled and I have trembled towards surrender. Chased my heart adrift and drifted home again. Funded blessing till I've been desperate to find redemption. And every time I turn around, Lord, you're still there. I was found before I was lost. I was yours before I was not. Grace to spare for all my And I know I don't deserve this kind of love Somehow this kind of love is who you are It's a grace I could never add up be somebody you still want but somehow you love me as you find me who am I to be your glory needs my praises this borrowed breath is yours, Lord, take it all. You are faithful and you are gracious and I'm just grateful. To think you don't need a single thing and still you want my yours before I was not you wear the scars for all my mistakes 
and that my distress me Cause I know I don't deserve this kind of love Somehow this kind of love is who you are it's a grace I could never add up to be somebody you still want. But somehow, love me as you find me.
thank you for your love and not leaving us and just being here with us and saturating our hearts and our minds and our souls with who you are. Go before us today as we are about to receive your word, Lord. Be with Pastor as he shares what you have for us. Thank you that we have this place. We can gather, we can listen and learn and head out and be changed, Lord. Thank you for today and thank you for being with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, good morning, good morning. How's everybody this morning? Good. Well, you don't sound good. Man, we, we uh, <laughs> Satan is attacking us hard, man. I mean, you know, it seems like every time we get ready to put out a stream or anything, it just seems like he comes at us, man. I want to thank Micah for figuring out what the heck was going on this morning. Because I was in a panic. I'm like, man, we're not streaming. We're not streaming. What's going on? We're not streaming. And, uh, but the young buck got it. So thank you, Mike. I appreciate it, man. Way to come through. Mike is that kind of a dude. So anyways, man, we are continuing our look at sayings that are not in the Bible. The first week we looked at God wants me to be happy, right? And God does want us to be happy, but God's happiness for us is a little bit different than what we want as far as happiness. Then we looked at forgiveness is optional. And you always hear people say, hey, you know what, you don't have to keep forgiving them for that. Or, or you know what, that, that's, that's, that's just unforgivable. I'm sorry, but forgiveness is not optional. We are called to forgive. Last week we looked at lying is okay in the right situation. People say all the time, man, well, it's all right to tell a white lie, pastor, isn't it, man, if it kind of keeps that person from having their feelings hurt. No, lying is not okay. Today, we're going to move on to our next subject. <laughs> and this is probably the, the most, this is probably the biggest catchphrase in the church. And I'll explain why here in a few seconds. But let me just start off with this. It's funny how we always seem to want to give advice, right? No matter what the situation is, no matter what people are going through, we just cannot help ourselves, but we got to give you advice. We're going to give you advice on your health. We're going to tell you how you should be eating, how you should be exercising, you know. You shouldn't be doing this. You shouldn't be doing that. We're going to tell people how they should be in relationships. Well, you're not in a healthy relationship there. Maybe you're not in a healthy relationship, and it's a good thing you do have that person in that situation. But a lot of times we're just giving advice and saying things almost like, I don't know, like we just think we know everything, I guess. We talk to people about money, dating, jobs. We cannot help ourselves. And it seems like every time someone is going through something, there's one phrase that gets thrown out there in every situation. Let me see if you can catch the phrase. I'm going to play some videos, and you let me know if you can catch what that phrase is. Man, the pastor is really on one today. I don't know, man. I mean, I don't know. Sometimes it's just really hard to be around. Hey, don't hey, worry about it. about it. God will never give you more than you can handle. You have kids. You, have you understand. understand. My girls My don't girls want to do anything, anything anymore. anymore. You just got to stop hanging in. Just keep, 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 keep going, 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 going. Just, just keep, keep trying. trying. Never give Never up give on up. Hey, hey, don't worry don't about, it. about it. God won't God give you more than you can handle. Oh, man, another bird just, another bird just pooped, pooped on my car. On my car. <laughs> oh, bro, that's, bro, so, that's messed so messed up. up. 
Hey man, don't worry about it. God won't, God give, won't give you more than you can handle. Man, that pastor husband of mine. Hey, don't worry about it. God won't give you more than you can handle. So, did you figure out what the phrase, what's the phrase? God won't give you more than you can handle, right? People say that all the time. And I'm going to tell you something. It's the most insensitive thing you can say. Well, no, pastor. We're just trying to encourage people. Let me put it in another perspective, man. You just lost your spouse, man. She just died. God won't give you more than you can handle, man. Right? You just lost your job, man. You don't know how you're going to support your family. Hey, don't worry about it, bro. God won't give you more than you can handle. You just been told you got a bad disease, man. You got six months to live. Don't sweat it, bro. God won't give you more than you can handle. I've heard this used in so many different situations. I myself have used it in the past. So here's my question this morning. Is this saying in the Bible and is it biblical? Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you that we can look at your word in an honest and relevant way, Lord. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would guide us and direct us and teach us, Lord. Father, our hearts are always to come alongside of people and encourage them, Lord, but we have to encourage them with the right words, with the things that are biblical. So go before us today, God, and we thank you in Jesus' name. And all the church said... The first thing I want to do is I want to look at the author and finisher of our faith, Jesus himself. Now, if you're in Matthew, where we're going to be at here in a second, Matthew 26, Jesus has had his discourse with his disciples. He has had what we call the Last Supper. He's, he's uh, taken the bread and the cup. He's broke it. He has said that, hey, the betrayer is here at the table with us. And then he's going to leave with his disciples, and he's going to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. If you open up your Bibles and your tablets and your phones or whatever you have to Matthew 26, starting in verse 36, it reads, Then Jesus went with them to the olive grove called Gethsemane, and he said, Sit here while I go over there to pray. And he took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, and he became anguished and distressed. He told them, My soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Do, do you see the words that Jesus says here? He says, my soul, the very being, my, my inner being is crushed with grief. Anyone here this morning or online ever felt that way? Ever been in a situation where your soul was so grieved that it felt like it was being crushed? And he says, to the point of death. Now, this is Jesus, right? This is Jesus, God in the flesh, who is having this moment in his life. You think Jesus was a little overwhelmed? Think maybe he's having kind of a bad day? And there wasn't a voice from heaven saying, I won't give you more than you can handle, Jesus. No, you don't hear that. In fact, when you go further into the text here, in verse 39, it says, He went a little farther, this is Jesus, and bowed with his face to the ground, praying, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Look, here we see Jesus vulnerable and open to the Father. He bows his face to the ground. It's a sign of surrender. And he says, man, Father, if it's possible, please take this cup of suffering from me. I don't want to go through this. I don't want this. And guess what happens? God is silent. There's no response from God in here. He didn't respond to Jesus. Jesus is in the moment of his life where he is feeling the weight of what is going to happen to him. Now, people say, well, 
Jesus was God, so man, it's different for him. He was God in the flesh, but his flesh was still flesh. He knew the pain that he was going to feel when they scourged his back and ripped his flesh from his back. He knew the pain that he was going to feel as they put thorns on his head. Not them little wimpy rose thorns we have. Big old hanging four or five inch thorns that they drove into his skull. He knew the pain he was going to feel as the nails went into his hands and his feet. Then he was hung before the world in shame. He felt it. He knew it. Just because he was God in the flesh doesn't mean his flesh didn't feel it. It did. He felt everything that you and I feel. And it's no different for him than it was for us in the fact that he drew his strength not from himself, but from the Father. The Apostle Paul had something to say about overwhelming circumstances in his life. If you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 8, it reads, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters. He says, look, I, I want you to have the information here about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Paul says here, man, we were experiencing, experiencing things so horrendous that he says they were under this great pressure far beyond their ability to endure. And it was so bad that they said, man, we despaired of life. It's up there like, man, Lord, just take us out of here. We cannot take it. He says, we felt like we had the sentence of death on us. But then he says something so important. This happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. When we use the term, God won't give you more than you can handle, it's on us now. We're putting us. It's my strength. It's it's who I am. God won't give you more than I can handle. No, we're to surrender. We're to surrender our hearts to God and rely on him, not ourselves. So church, where in the world did we come up with this saying? God will not give you more than you can handle. Well, it comes from a misinterpretation of scripture. Right? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. This is the culprit. Paul writes, the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. Paul is writing about temptation. He's writing about that time when you're at the computer and you want to click on that site you shouldn't click on. Or the time when you're standing in front of the cash register and you're going to take some money out of it so you can have something for lunch. Or the time when you're going to lie to your best friend because you don't want to get caught up in something. No, Paul's talking about the temptation for sin. He's not talking about the overwhelming circumstances in our lives. That's not what he's talking about. He was talking about temptation. Because let me tell you something. Jesus never said you would not have bad days. In fact, he said just the opposite. If you go to John chapter 16, verse 20, it says, Very truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. Jesus plainly states that we are going to weep and mourn, and we are going to be in this state of mind, church, until Jesus comes. The birth he's talking about here is when Jesus comes, the new birth that will come, and the world is set in order the way it was meant to be. We're going to feel overwhelmed, church. We're going to feel overwhelmed. We're going to feel like we can't go another day in the circumstances that we're in. 
But then Jesus goes and says something else in John 16, 33. He's got a lot to say there, but I want to look at the first part. He says, I have told you these things so that in me, in Jesus, you may have peace. He didn't say, God won't give you more than you can handle. He didn't say that. He said, in me, you may have peace. He didn't say you were always going to find a parking spot at Walmart. He didn't, he didn't say, hey, you got this. You're going to crush it, right? He didn't say, own it. He didn't say the Wi-Fi was always going to work. He didn't say you were never going to have a breakup in a relationship, that you were never going to lose a job. He didn't say that the plumbing was going to work every single day in your house. He didn't say that. He says, look, you're going to have grief. You're going to have mourning. You're going to be weeping. But he says, I've told you these things so that in me you have peace. In me, Jesus. And then, in a, then as we read further into 1633, it says, in this world you will have trouble. I'm sorry. Church, you're going to have trouble in this world. We're going to have trouble. Listen, write this down. Pain is a promise. Struggle is certain. Suffering in this world is inevitable. Welcome to the refuge, right? <laughs> Feel good about yourself. Listen, I know some of you are in the middle of a difficult season right now. You feel left out. You're overlooked. You're rejected. You're all alone. You're wondering, man, where is God in all of this? Maybe you've lost your confidence in your ability to do something. Maybe you're battling depression this morning. You know what? I'm going to tell you something, church. There's a stigma out there that if a Christian is depressed, it's bad. Well, it is bad. But listen, depression is a natural part of life. Charles Spurgeon, one of the greatest preachers of all time, would sometimes spend two, three, four weeks in bed from depression. What? The great Charles Spurgeon, who talked about faith and eternity and all these other great things, would get so depressed that he would have to literally stay in bed for weeks? Yes. The spirit of depression is real. If you're battling depression this morning, don't be kicking yourself. Don't be thinking, oh, shucks, how can I be a Christian? You are a Christian, but you're battling depression. Read Paul's words. He was depressed, right? He was shipwrecked for days. He was this, he was that. He tells you, man. He was anxious, full of anxiety. Some of you are anxious this morning, full of anxiety. Listen, it's part of our walk. It's part of our human nature. There's going to be bad news. There's going to be financial struggles. There's going to be health ch challenges. Relationships are going to fall apart, man. The pressure you're feeling this morning may be unbearable. You're afraid. You're hurting. No one understands. It, it's, it's, it's more, it, it, what I'm going through is more than is humanly possible. That's how you feel. Guess what? That's where God wants you. What? Yeah. That's where God wants you. See, God puts us through trials and tribulations, right, for a purpose and for a reason. Peter says it well in his epistle. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, he says, So be truly glad. There is a wondrous joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. Did you catch what he said there? These trials will show that your faith is genuine. Listen, God gives us more than we can handle to bring out a genuine faith in us. That's what it's there for, right? To bring out a genuine faith. But I'm going to tell you, if there's genuine faith, there's also a counterfeit faith. There's a counterfeit faith. What do you mean, pastor? Well, I'll tell you what I mean. In today's church, I believe there is a counterfeit faith at work. People come. And, and they come to church, and they know how to be Christian. They can speak Christianese and all this other stuff, right? They're really good at it. They know when to stand and raise their hands in worship. They know how to throw out a few amens uh, during the preaching. Get the hint? 
Um, and so, uh, anyways, they, they, uh, they, here's the thing. They do all these things, man. Oh, bless you, brother. Bless you, sister. You know? And then they go back to their lives. They leave the church. And they leave whatever they experienced inside this building. Because these walls aren't the church. We're the church, the body of Christ people. And they walk outside, and somehow they just leave Jesus in the building. And they go about their day, and they go about their week. And they do it until next Sunday, and then the cycle begins again. Hey, brother, I'm blessed, you know. Throw your hands in worship and hallelujah, right? We're really good at this, man. Listen, it looks real from the outside, but the roots don't go deep underneath. Church. Genuine faith is a faith that goes deep. Cannot be ground level faith. It doesn't work. I know this so well because there was a point in my life when I was living like this. I thought I was in this deep, meaningful relationship with Jesus, man. Man, I thought I was rocking it. I was doing all these things for Jesus. But my faith wasn't real, man. It wasn't real. It was fabricated. It was fabricated on me doing what I wanted to do and then calling it faith in Christ. I knew all the right things to do. I knew how to talk Christianese. I knew how to pray for people and stuff, man. I knew how to do all that stuff, man. But the reality is, is that it looked real from the outside, but... My roots didn't go deep underneath. And I'll tell you what's crazy is as a pastor, right, people confess things to me all the time. They just can't help themselves, right? You get with people, you start talking, and they start talking, and pretty soon you're listening. And, and, you know, I mean, there have been times when I've been out at lunch with someone, and I'll be at lunch, and we'll get into a conversation with the waiter, and the next thing you know, they're confessing stuff and asking for prayer, Man, I used to go to church. Man, I got caught up. I got caught up in a. I'm, I'm a, I got caught up in meth, or I got caught up in this. I got caught up in that. They they tried the church thing. They tried it. They went to church and felt good about going. They connected at a low level church. We've got to be connecting at a high level, not a low level. But then something bad happens in their life, and it blows them out of the church. It blows them out. If God cared, this would not have happened. How many people have said that? How many, pe- how many times have you or I said that? I've said it. But remember, Jesus told a parable about the sower who sowed seed. He said, there was seed that was sown amongst the thorns and the thistles, and they they grew up and they, the, the cares and the worries of life choked out that seed. There was seed that had been thrown on shallow ground, but trouble or persecution came and it quickly fell away, right? Jesus himself said that. Church, listen, trials are a part of life. And the devil knows this and will do whatever he can to take our eyes off of Jesus. But here's the thing. God wants us to trust Him. When we go through rough times, He doesn't tell us, I won't give you more than you can handle. Instead, He says, lean on me and I will handle it. Trust me in this. That's what God tells us. Write this one down. A faith that has been tested is a faith that can be trusted. Did you catch that one? A faith that has been tested is a faith that can be trusted. Our faith is not real until until it's put to the test. It's not real. Faith has to be tested. It's like the analogy I use about faith. Nobody came in this church today and, and inspected the chair you sat in. You didn't come in and lift that baby up and check it and make sure it was sturdy. You sat down in that chair in faith. You sat down in that chair in faith. Your faith had to be tested. What would have happened if you just sat in the chair and it fell apart? You'd be like, whoa, whoa, what's going on here, you know? And your faith would have been shook up a little bit. 
instead of realizing that maybe that was just one bad chair or an isolated incident, now every chair is bad. Everything, every chair is, is going to break when I sit on it. Church, a faith that has been tested is a faith that can be trusted. And let me tell you about faith that, that, that has been tested. It does serve a purpose, and that purpose is that it prepares you for your purpose. Trials and tribulations and your faith being tested prepares you for your purpose. You grow stronger, you get bigger in your faith, and you get prepared for the next step God has for you. I got a news flash for everybody in here. This is going to be for all those comfy Christians. Ease and comfort never make you strong. Ease and comfort never make you strong. When you go to the gym, what increases your strength? Resistance. Resistance is what increases your strength. You don't get strong just sitting there and looking at the weights. You don't go, wow, man, I feel so much stronger looking at that barbell. No, you have to get under the barbell, and you have to lift, and you have to let the resistance work your muscles so that your muscles break down and then heal back up, and they heal stronger and bigger. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that, you're testing, uh, that the testing of your faith produces, produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Do you understand that God puts us through things because he doesn't want us to lack anything? Actually, God is giving us more when we go through things. And you may not see the point of what you're going through. You may not see it. You might be discouraged. You might be overwhelmed. You might even be afraid. But listen, could it be that God's preparation comes packaged in pain? Could it just be that? Could it be that God's preparation for you comes packaged in pain? Think about it. How did he prepare Joseph to save a nation? It was through pain. He was rejected by his brothers. They were going to kill him. And then he was sold into slavery. And then he was taken to Egypt. And then while he was in Egypt, he was falsely accused of trying to, to rape Potiphar, or Potiphar's wife, I should say. And the thing is, is that it was all of that that went into Joseph's preparation to be the second in command in Egypt. All that pain he went through, all that rejection he went through, all that anxiety he went through, it prepared him for what God had for him. King David, when he was a boy, defeats Goliath. How did he get there? He gets in fights with lions and bears. I'm not feeling that. I'm married to a bear. I know how it is. I had to throw that one out there, you know. <laughs> Listen, I am not going to go out and tangle with a bear or a lion. I'm like, I'm good. But you know what? God knew that that would prepare him for the real giant that he was going to face later in his life. Pain prepared Peter to preach at Pentecost. He failed Jesus miserably. Peter was, I am the guy. I'm the man. I'm the dude. I'm the toughest guy here. I'm the strongest guy here. I'm the loudest guy here. It's me. I will not leave you, Jesus. I will not leave you. I will die with you. Yet, three times, he rejects the notion that he knew Jesus. He failed Jesus miserably. But yet Jesus restores Peter through that brokenness and through that pain. And Peter preaches a Pentecostal message that brings 3,000 to a life-giving relationship with Jesus. Your pain and my pain is preparing us for what God has. And yeah, we don't like it. We don't like the pain. We don't like that uncomfortable feeling. Uh, we actually, we can't stand it. But yet, if we trust the Lord and believe in God, we know that he's doing a work in our lives. You know, one of the ways that, believe it or not, that we, we learn to grow is through criticism. As a pastor, I get criticized a lot. 
I get criticized for something I, I'll get criticized for something I said today, questioned about something I said today. I, I, I get questioned about things all the time. People are always offering me advice on everything in my life, you know. I mean, it does, I don't, can tell you that as a pastor, you are, if you want to be a pastor, be ready to be criticized because people are going to criticize you for every decision you make. And I've learned something through the years. The compliments and praise didn't prepare me for this position. Rejection and criticism did. That's what prepared me for it. People are always telling me what I need to do, and I just smile and thank them. Thank you. You know? They want to tell me how this relationship's not good or, or I'm doing this wrong in this relationship and blah, blah, blah. And I thank you very much. I appreciate it. And there's always a hint of truth in everything. So I'm not, I don't totally reject everything. But I'm telling you that compliments and praise didn't do anything to prepare me. In fact, it destroyed me. It destroyed me. And it's hard for us to be rejected. It's hard. Three times I went for a supervisor position in my department. Three times. All three times I was ranked number one. All three times I was the most qualified person. And all three times I got rejected. You know how hurt I was? I'm looking at God going, don't you understand? We need Christian leaders in here, God. We need, we need somebody that loves Jesus in here. But you know what? That rejection prepared me. Because when I finally did become a supervisor... I was really, truly ready for it. The other three times, I really wasn't ready. I thought I was. I knew I was called to be a pastor. I, I knew it from six months, seven months into my, my walk as a Christian. Yet many times I was passed over by someone else to go plan a church somewhere or go out and do something. And I'd be like, man, are you, are you kidding me? God, what's, what, what? Really? I discipled that person. What? But listen, man. God was preparing me. He was preparing me for something way different than I ever imagined. And let me tell you some, two things that I want you to understand about trials and tribulations. Number one, trials won't weaken your faith. They'll make your faith stronger. Right? Tell yourself it's not just pain. It's preparation. It's God preparing me. And the second thing is, is the next time you're turned down for something, you weren't turned down, you're just getting toughened up. That's what's happening. You're getting toughened up. The next time that you're offended by someone, they say something you don't like and you're upset about it, just remember God is purifying your heart. That's what he's doing. He's purifying your heart. The next time you're lonely and nobody's there and you're feeling like you're the only person in the world, just remember God is teaching you to trust him like never before. The next time you're betrayed by somebody close to you, somebody that you trust, somebody that you've poured your life into, just remember that God is expanding your capacity to love and to forgive. And the next time that you have a setback, remember it's a setup for God to show up and show off in your life because that's who God is. If you're wrecked with pain this morning, I promise you, there is a purpose in your pain. There is a purpose in it. And God wants you to lean into him this morning. Well, pastor, that's real easy for you to say. You don't know what I'm going through. I hear that all the time. Everybody's situation and everybody's pain is far worse than anybody else's. That's how we view ourselves. That's how we look at ourselves. Whatever I'm going through, no matter what you're going through, there's no way that your pain can match mine. You know, there's a lot of people who go through stuff that never say a word, and they're going through the worst pain in their life. They're going through pain like you've never experienced, and they never say a word. You don't know what somebody else's situation is. Never assume that your situation is the worst situation, because you might be surprised. Yeah, I don't know what you're going through. You don't know what I'm going through. It's easy for us to spout off quotes and everything from the Bible because we think that somehow my pain or your pain is, is, is greater or to a greater degree. 
here's the thing, it doesn't matter. I don't have to understand what you're going through to know that you're going through it and that I need to pray for you and that you need to pray for me. We belong to Christ. We belong to Jesus. And in closing, I want you to understand that Jesus contrasts two things in John chapter 16, verse 33. He contrasts in the world and he contrasts in him, in Christ. He says, in the world, you're going to have trouble. Yes, there's going to be divorce. There's going to be cancer. There's going to be children on drugs. There's going to be abuse. You're going to be facing all sorts of crazy situations. That's the world. But in Christ, he says, in me, he says, you will have this. You will have peace. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 says, For everyone born of God overcomes the world. Did you hear that? We overcome the world, church. The world doesn't overcome us. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God today? Because the last part of John 16, says this, In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. Take heart. I have overcome the world. So church, this morning, God is not saying, I'm, going, I'm not going to give you more than you can handle. God is saying this morning, I am going to give you more than you can handle. Because I want you to trust me. I want you to put your faith in me. Yes, you will experience difficulty and pain. Yes. Church, we experience it at a high level all the time. But it's in those moments. It's not, I'm going to rise up. It's going to be, Jesus has risen up. And the resurrected power of Christ that lives in me is going to lift me up. And I'm going to be able to endure it not on my own strength, but on the power and strength of who Jesus is. The good news isn't that Jesus saves us from our pain, church. The good news is, is that Jesus saves us from our sins. That's the good news. So remember, God will give you more than you can handle. But it's because he wants you to come to him and give it to him and allow him to carry you through. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you for this word. Thank you for this reminder that... We need to be careful about what we say, what's in the Bible, what isn't in the Bible. Father, I just thank you that you love us and you care for us and you want us to know the truth. And Lord, may we be encouragers. May we have the Barnabas spirit in us where we encourage others, uplift others, and care for others. Father, I pray you'd go before us this day, Lord, and may we reflect on what you've told us today, God, and may we apply it to our hearts. And we ask this humbly now in Jesus' name, amen.